Okay, so now we are dealing with the second half of the Renaissance, which is actually more than half of it, since it's amassing all of the other countries in Europe besides Italy. And there are a few places that are not quite in it, and mainly it's because, like, for instance, Spain and Portugal are still primarily under the auspices of Islam, as opposed to the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Northern Portugal and Spain are still are Holy Roman Catholic, and yet the vast majority are still not. However, what encapsulates the cha chapter eight and the Renaissance in the North is a shift, a dramatic and volatile shift away from Holy Roman Catholic belief. Now, it's not that people become unchristian, although there are some people who actually do leave the faith entirely. It's it essentially stems from the fact that they are going back to the text and a bunch of other things. And instead of, diff they're not so much differing with major beliefs of the Christian church, you know, what Christianity is, but uh, uh, essentially they're rejecting the authority and the power of the Holy Roman Catholic Church over their lives and over their salvation and over their faith. And so that's what this becomes. Now, this has been building as if you guys have been paying attention to, you know, both in the readings and in the lectures, this has been building for centuries. And the Catholic Church did many things that kind of stepped on a lot, the toes of a lot of different people. Remember, even as, as early as the, you know, even within the medieval period, they used, they had ecclesiastical courts that where they could essentially imprison you without even charging you for years. They could torture you to death with impunity. They could hold a trial where you were not even allowed to be present, let alone testify in your own defense, that you were not allowed to have a lawyer. You know, all the things that were typical in, in daily life in the, at the, in the domestic sphere and in the, just the governmental sphere, those rules did not apply to the ecclesiastical courts. The church could do anything it wanted. And it thought so with impunity. Okay, and we're going to get to why it's not true. But because of that, though, there was an, you know, a growing disbelief in many of the, the, the typical practices of the, of the church. There was certainly a growing assumption that much of the, these practices were corrupt. They were meant to gain wealth and to wield power over municipalities and people. And so there was, you know, at, with this, you know, growing distrust of the authorities within the church and a lot of the church doctrine came a call essentially through a lot of scholarship to translate the Bible from Latin, to make it accessible to human beings so that anybody can read it, you know, put it in the vernacular. And I'll use that word a lot, the vernacular. And all that means is put it in your common language. So here in the United States, we really have one major vernacular and that is English. But then we also have other people, you know, we have Spanish speaking churches, we have Korean speaking churches, we have churches in, you know, a few other, a smattering of other languages. But predominantly, the common language in the United States is English. Common language in Great Britain at that time was English, but it included Welsh, Cornish, and a bunch of other um, languages that are somewhat connected. The primary language in Italy was Italian. In Spain was Spanish, Portuguese, Portu you know, Portugal was Portuguese, France was French, you know, Germany was German, and on and on and on. So, if we're going to read the Bible, we need to be able to, we shouldn't have to read it in Latin, is what everybody's saying, especially since at this point, no one is raised speaking and reading Latin. The only people that read and speak Latin predominantly are clergy people. And so, that means that the text has for many, many, over a millennium been kept from the people who follow it and follow its precepts. And so that's going to shift here. And it's going to go a little slowly, but not really. But there, it, it's going to mean, though, that the Renaissance here in the North is going to be far different from the same Renaissance that was happening in, in Italy a, a slightly earlier. It meant, too, that much of it was going to be dictated by that shift from Catholicism to Protestantism or a protest against, you know, faith that was developed from a protest against the Holy Roman Catholic Church. That's where pro the word Protestantism comes from. So um, the truth is, is it was on all different fronts, though. This was something that was that stemmed from humanism and the desire to have a more direct connection to one's faith and to God.
not having the church as a, as a go-between. It was also economic because the church owned more acreage and had more wealth than any other entity in Europe. And, and it would wield that wealth and wield that power and influence sometimes against other municipalities. And so those municipalities began to dominate instead and insist on creating laws that were separate from and not influenced by or, or dictated by the church in the neighborhood. And so it's kind of like today we have, there are some states with what we call blue laws here in the United States. Uh, South Carolina was one, and I lived there for several years. That meant that according to those blue laws, because of religious dictates, uh, you could not buy anything except for groceries until 1.30 on a Sunday. So it had to be after church. And you also could not purchase alcohol any time after 9 p.m. on Saturday night. In Oklahoma, the blue law was midnight. So as soon as it hit midnight in Oklahoma, you could no longer purchase alcohol because it, that was Sunday morning. So that kind of thing happened. But those blue laws are dictated by church. So essentially what would happen is in these areas, church, you know, the, the church and the, the religious officials would say, no shops can be open on Sundays. And then the shops would say, wait, we're losing business because people come on weekends and they want to shop and we should be able to be open. Even ideas about the religious laws, like for instance, clergy were supposed to be, um, they took a vow of cel celibacy, both the men and the women. And that was required, it still is required by most orders of the Catholic church today. And yet people would joke that, well, they're not really keeping the, their, their vow of celibacy. And they weren't, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of them were not. Popes, we knew of some popes who, popes who literally had open, um, assignations with their mistresses, you know, they would bring them to things like a date. And that's not the, you know, they, they had taken, they had taken a vow too of celibacy and yet they absolutely were not keeping that vow. In fact, they used to have this running joke that the, the babies who were left at the doors of convents were actually the, the nuns own babies because the nuns were sleeping with the priests and they were getting pregnant. And so there was definitely an assumption that the, the church officials were not nearly as, as sanctimonious as they really, you know, they, they, they were sinning much more than they um, allowed people to know. And so they were accusing everybody else of being sinful, and yet they were not living the life that they were, they had vowed to live. And so there was definitely a distrust of that as well. But a lot of it was just monetary. The church wanted to dictate who was going to be the mayor of the town. They wanted to dictate who would, you know, what laws were passed and what wasn't. And the town didn't want them to do that. The town wanted to have that control themselves. It's kind of like the reason why, for instance, in the United States, even as a, according to our Bill of Rights, we have what is called the separation of church and state. So no one denomination of Christianity or one faith dictates what happens in our government system, at least it's not supposed to. It's public schools are not supposed to be religious. Um, and the you know, student can, can pray if they want to, but the, no government led prayer is supposed to happen. No religious indoctrination is supposed to happen within the, the, the public school classroom. And that's because the two things are supposed to be separate, not because religion is bad, but because they don't want, they didn't want the United States to become a theocracy where one particular brand or sect of Christianity took over and dictated what everyone could do. Now we know, if you know, there are tons of churches all around. Some of you are probably pretty religious. Some of you are probably not religious at all. Some of you may never have gone to church before. None of us necessarily wants anyone else dictating to us what we do based upon their sense of what faith is or their sense of what's right and wrong. We should be allowed, as long as we don't infringe on the rights of others, you know, on their freedoms, we should be allowed to live as we want to. That's the whole idea around that freedom of speech, freedom of religion. You know, the, the government is not supposed to pass laws to limit all of those things. We should have the freedom to choose how we want to live. Well, that's kind of going on in these as well. Do we, does someone have to be a high, you know, up, way up high up in the Catholic church to be a leader in the town? For the township, no, they don't. They don't even have to go to church. 
to be a leader in the town. And so that's essentially the division that was happening. The church wanted to dictate more. In fact, even their requirement that um, people get a, a, a wedding ceremony that is officiated by a priest is a new thing. It used to be people could literally get married just by signing a contract saying, hey, we're married, and then doing what they call a hand fasting, where they just do a very brief civil ceremony and say, yeah, I want to be married to you, and yeah, I want to be married to you. No priest required. The church said, no, if you're going to have a real marriage, if it's, if it's actually ordained by the church and by God, you have to be married by a priest. And so that was expensive. And that's, I mean, and it meant sometimes being in a church was even more expensive. And so it really became harder and harder for people to obey the rules of the church because they were too expensive. Even the seven sacraments that were required all the way through extreme unction, you know, the, the last rites at one's death, each one of those cost something. And the church said none of those things could be done by anyone except for an ordained priest. And that meant more and more money for the church. So people saw it that way. When they, when all of, the, you know, the fact that the vow of poverty was part of, of religious orders and it wasn't being kept either um, was a problem. The Great Schism did not help people's view of religion. And so more and more, it wasn't that people wanted to reject Christianity, it's that they wanted to reject the Catholic Church as a pristine Christian organization. They saw it as, as powerful, too powerful, and they saw it as wielding that power, not for, you know, in favor of the people it was supposed to be serving, but even against the people that it was supposed to be serving. And so that became the big problem. And this, this is why all of, you know, this kind of stuff blew up. Now we do have some examples in this chapter about that are going to show altarpieces for you know that are very catholic in nature you know virgin mary jesus being depicted maybe even god but a lot of the typical iconographic paintings that were similar somewhat to medieval paintings however the vast majority of these have been were, were hidden once the protestant reformation happened and that's because if they hadn't been hidden, they would have been destroyed and we would no longer have them. We wouldn't be able to see what those paintings had been like. So it's a good thing we have a few that have survived, but the truth is, is once the Protestant Reformation happens, iconoclasm is gonna take over. And I'll talk about that. It, essentially, it's an absolute rejection of idolatry. And so, and it's a violent rejection of idolatry. So people would, who are, who are iconoclasts would essentially go into the, the, what it was once a Catholic church and all the statues, the three-dimensional, you know, statues that had been done would be destroyed. Often it would, they would burn the Catholic church to the ground and then start over. Or they would at least break all, you know, take off all of the artwork and tear it up or paint over the murals, you know, their frescoes on the wall, paint them all over so that it would just be whitewashed. And they would often shatter the, the stained glass windows and things like that. Where we have that stuff surviving you know, you think about the medieval, the monasteries and the medieval cathedrals that we've studied in the past. Most of those were in a handful of countries. So we don't have a lot of examples of medieval churches, for instance, that survived from Finland and Norway because those were almost systematically destroyed by Protestants. It was, a, it was that became the, like the public symbol of the corruption of the Holy Roman Catholic Church was this um, idolatry. And so iconoclasts often became extremely violent and people would even be killed while a, a church was being destroyed. It was, it was a very violent rejection of the idolatry, that what they saw as idolatry, the, the artwork that had been pretty much systemic in the Catholic church for over a millennium. So the vast majority of paintings that are painted after the Protestant shift happens are going to be secular. So there are going to be a lot of portraits of, pub, of private people in private homes, a lot of landscapes and things like that, stuff that is not religious in nature and certainly not intended to be inside of a church. And so I just want to make you know, make sure you know that you might get questions about how those two sides of artwork were different. And for the Italian Renaissance, it's still very religious. But for the Northern Renaissance, that is not the case. Most religious um, artwork at, made before, you know, early on in this period, once the, the Protestant Reformation took hold, would be destroyed. So probably, I mean, you have to give him 
the credit for this, even though he was one of many scholars at this time who were arguing for translating the Bible, changing the rules for some things like, you know, not requiring as many of the, these, um, these religious rights to happen in a person's life or arguing against the selling of indulgences or the papacies, you know, the, 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 the great schism, arguing for that kind of stuff. Martin Luther was actually an Augustinian monk. He was a Catholic monk. And he, you know, gauged, you know, what's popular opinion? You know, what are people saying about the church? And he examined the inner workings of the church itself and said, okay, what are we doing wrong? Why are we losing people? What, why are we angering people? How are we mis misusing our power? And how are we not serving the the faith that we say we are serving so how can we do this better it's almost like let's and so he created these improvements these these not these suggestions and he sent them formally to the pope and asked if he could meet with the pope and discuss them and the pope just sent them back and said no well that wasn't good enough for martin luther he said well you know you're not even going to listen you're not going to make, you know, if you don't make changes, bad things are going to happen, essentially, and you will lose people. And so he tried, you know, several times until he was finally told, just hush. Well, he didn't hush. Instead, he, he wrote them all out. They're called the 95 theses, and that's essentially 95 different ways the church needs to change, if you can think about it that way. You can buy these available. They're available in print. You can buy them from Amazon today. So, and they're very, they, they actually ended up printed over and over and over again as one of the, the main texts that was passed around to further the Protestant Reformation. And so, because so many people at least found many different items within these 95 theses that they totally agreed with needed to be reformed. So it pushed the conversation about reform forward. Okay, so he nailed these theses to the church, his actual own church in, uh, in Wittenberg, well, Wittenberg, um, in Germany, and other people took them. They were printed. Other, you know, ministers, you know, read parts of them and said, "Yeah, we need to fix these kinds of things." But it really started a big movement. The Pope found out about it that he had made them public, even though the Pope had said hush. And he actually he tried to get him to come to Rome, but he ended up coming to what a, a place called Worms, <laughs> and a, a benefactor helped him and said, "I'll give you a place to meet." And he met with church officials who tried to get him to recant and said, you will be excommunicated if you don't recant these statements. And Luther refused to recant and went home. The Pope signed an official order to excommunicate Luther. Luther took the excommunication, you know, he got the letter that said, you are officially excommunicated. He took it onto the steps of the Wittenberg Cathedral in front of all of his parishioners and burned it. And the Pope found out about that and he ordered his execution. In fact, he orders his, his execution in such a way that essentially says, if he, wherever he is caught, if he's caught inside somebody's barn, whoever's barn that is, those people will also be put to death. So it's not just a matter of, he's gonna, if you, once we find you, Martin Luther, we are going to put you to death. But no, anyone associating with him or anyone found to have harbored him will also be put to death. So it was an execution order for all of the people who might be allies. He, it was funny is that he was, he, he was never arrested. He was never found. And he died of natural causes after having gotten married and even having some children. Um, he essentially became the poster child for Protestantism. Now, obviously, from his name, you can best bet that the sect Lutheranism actually stemmed from his teachings, but a lot of different churches can can mark their origins with Martin Luther. Protestantism definitely took hold pretty strongly in Germany and it, in several of the different kind of city state, you know, sections of Germany, the regions of Germany. But he what he argued for was something that would be taken up by a lot of different reformers, not just Luther. So you didn't have to be Lutheran to agree with some of the things he said. One of them is that, first of all, all seven sacraments aren't necessary. These are all ways for the church to make money, but they're not all necessary. What's necessary? Baptism, communion, and marriage. That's it. 
He also said that clergymen did not have to be, you know, take a vow of celibacy. There's nothing in the Bible that says they have to be celibate. There is actually something in the Bible where Paul says, don't get married if you can avoid it. But if you feel like you're going to, you know, resort to fornication, then get married. That's what he says, literally. Well, Martin Luther said there's no reason why a man, it doesn't say that a man can't get married, that a priest cannot get married. So why don't we let them get married? Plus, they'd be better counselors for all these married couples who, you know, if they come for advice, if they actually have a marriage. So they can be a better example for their parishioners if they do so. He also said that the Bible needs to be translated for goodness sakes. And he translated it into German himself. And that German translation, because we have a printing press and it's no longer handwritten, that German translation was trans, was was copied and copied and copied and copied and copied and printed and thousands of printings of it were distributed everywhere. And that meant that people could, for the first time, read the Bible in their own language. And once they started reading the Bible, they realized that much of what the Catholic Church had essentially created and, and said was scripture could not be found. Like many of these rules that the Catholics, that the Catholic hierarchy had determined were, were necessary, were not part of the New Testament or even the Old Testament at all. And, and there was no real basis, in fact. They were much more of Catholic tradition than they were Christian tradition, if that makes sense. In fact, it went to so far that there were reformers who essentially claimed that Catholics weren't Christian at all. Now, I think that's a little over, you know, when people say, well, they're not even Christian, Catholics are Christians. But they're just a different, today, they're a, 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 different, a different denomination that's of, of Christianity. Um, and I'm not here to decide who's a Christian and who isn't, you know, I just, everybody's welcome. That's, that's not my job. But for him, essentially, he said all these rules that they had made, a lot of them were really arbitrary. He also said that the Pope was not the authority and should never be the authority of the church. What the Pope says isn't necessarily what the Bible says. And if, when in doubt, go to the Bible and look at what it says instead. He also said, and this is another thing that we still in Protestants especially use today, is the church service should not be passive. Remember, people were going to church and it was in Latin and the songs were in Latin and everything was in Latin and they didn't understand half of what was going on anyway. But he said, no, no, no. Ch first of all, church services should be in the vernacular. Use the Bible. That's the translation in the vernacular. And let's do what we can to encourage people participation of the congregation. So let's have them sing the hymns. That's why today in most Protestant churches, we have hymnals and everybody's supposed to sing. And in fact, he created quite a few hymns that were used not only in Lutheran churches, but were used in other hymnals and other sects of Christianity. And he, most of many of these, these hymns were set to popular tunes so that they would be really easy for people to learn. They'd already kind of know the tune. All they had to do is use the words. And the words were taken, you know, kind of retranslations of Psalms and, and other um, passages from the, the Bible. So they were, it was a way for people to actively participate in expression of, of biblical text. And so, he, and that's what he wanted. He, he said, people need to be, lay, we need to have laymen who are leaders, people who are participating in, in the service itself, not just passively um, taking it in. But he also said, and this is probably the biggest thing, this is absolutely, this was mind blowing for many people. It's still mind blowing for a lot of people today, but he came up with the idea of grace. He said, look, if Jesus died for our sins, and that was one of the basic tenets of the Nicene Creed, then why, are, why do good works matter? He's died for our sins already. We have grace, which means no matter, even if we do bad things, we're still going to heaven because God has given us grace. He died already so that we wouldn't have to. And so that grace was, it essentially said all those indulgences that the Catholic Church, you know, sells, all of the candles people pay for it, you know, for the people that they know were kind of sinful in their lifetime, their relatives and stuff, so that they won't end up in hell. You know, even the idea of hell makes no sense because God has given us grace. And so that shifted radically what was going on so you know if we if essentially grace became the 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 height of what was going on now other people took it differently of course john calvin is you don't necessarily remember thomas munzer 
Um, but he took it as, well, church needs to be much more kind of like, remember, if you go back to Islam, when Muhammad said, you know, we have to part of the one of the five tenets of, of Islam is to to give alms to the poor, to help people who are in need. And so Thomas Munzer said, look, if the church is really going to do what it's supposed to, it needs to protect the poor people. The peasants need to be helped. And that meant leading a rebellion. And he did. He was actually killed. He was he was executed. Um, and the, the rebellion failed miserably and tons of peasants died. I mean, they were they were, you know, fighting with shovels and rakes and, and you know, farm implements against trained soldiers. There was no way they were going to win. And they were far outnumbered. Um, so the peasants pretty much got slaughtered and he was taken prisoner and executed. But for him, true church meant reform. Like the church should be a force for helping those in need in, in the, the real world, not just for helping our souls after death or something. So he took it much more literally. John Calvin, who's, I mean, his, his ideas are, I mean, it's called Calvinism. But his ideas actually talk a lot about they they, they lead into what became the Puritans, um, the Anabaptists, who later became the Baptists and the Presbyterians. Although we have two sects of Presbyterianism in the United States, and I think there are more around the world, but two, two that are primary within the U.S. One is very liberal and one is much more conservative. And I, I, I can't remember exactly which is which, so I'm not going to name them, but one's like the Presbyterian church usa and the other one is something else and and one of his, one one is more like calvin and one is less they'll both trace their roots to him calvin believed in what what is called predestination he came up with this idea so here's grace on one side where everybody gets to go because jesus died for everybody okay that's that's martin luther then we have john calvin and he says look everybody doesn't get to go okay that's bogus a bunch of people are going to go to hell in fact, a lot of people are going to go to hell and some people are going to go to heaven. But, you know, God is omnipotent. So he is all powerful. God, God is omniscient. So he knows everything. And God is omnipresent. He is in everything. He is always there. And so he knows before you're even born, which side you're going to be on. Are you going to be an evil person? Or are you going to be a good person? Are you going to go to hell or are you going to go to heaven? And so he said, all you have to do is watch the signs. People are going to sin because they're already destined for hell. Not to get there, but because they already are going to go there. God already knows that. So he left them alone. He's like, fine, go and sin because you're going to go to hell anyway. He already knew that. And the people who are pure and honest and, and you know, have pristine, you know, lives and everything else and are, you know, are paragons of their community. Well, those people have already been predestined for heaven. So this is why I say it, you know, the Puritans kind of stem from this. For the Puritans, any sign of rebellion against church doctrine, of sinfulness, you know, whether it be in what you wear or what you do in your life or whether you go to a gambling establishment or drink or wear jewelry or wear makeup or, you know, whatever, whatever you happen to do is a sign that you're either going to heaven or hell. And so you certainly don't want to associate with people who are doing the bad things because that's a sign that you're also going to hell. So it became, I mean, really important that you, you be pristine in everything that you do publicly, that you keep up appearances. And this is going to be, if you ever read or have read, if you have read the Scarlet Letter, read it again, because you probably read it in school and your teacher probably didn't do a good job with it. But in, in the Scarlet Letter, if you haven't read it, wait until you're like 30 or 35 years old and then read it. I liked it before, but I, I, every time I reread it, I liked it more. But it deals a lot with this idea of appearances versus reality. And you can be, you can look pure on the outside and be impure. Or you can be honest about your, your failings and be far purer than all the people who are pretending to be pure. And that's this idea that you, you but, but for John Calvin, it was the public that mattered. So if you look like you're pristine on the outside, then you are. And if you look like you're sinful, then you are. But he also equated this with wealth. So, and I've seen a few, you know, billboards where it says, God wants you to be rich or something like that. Well, he totally believes that. So people who are born into richer families or who make a lot of money, even if they do it through corrupt practices, 
that's showing that God shows them favor. And if they're poor and destitute, or they have a lot of financial troubles, or they, you know, an earthquake gets their house and they have bad luck, if you think about it, for him, that's a sign God hates them. So he would have gone up to Job in the Bible and he would have said, oh, see, your, your wife died and you got sick and now you're walking around with these sores all over your skin. Well, that just means God hates you because he really did believe that. And unfortunately, many other sects did too. And so part of that, you know, I have to be perfect and everything has to look good on the outside meant that a lot of Calvinists became iconoclasts. So we cannot have the appearance of two and three dimensional idolatry inside of our church. It must be destroyed. We cannot have the appearance of witchcraft. We cannot have the appearance of any sinfulness. So that, that led a lot of, of Puritans to ban theater, to ban, you know, the, the, the bars had to be closed, that no one was allowed to drink. You know, it's kind of like the temperance movement of the very early 20th century. You know, we need to prevent everybody from doing sinful things. That was absolutely from this movement with John Calvin. Now, other people were less, less religiously bent. And often they argued about, okay, so, you know, should we even be studying the classics or is that anti-Catholic? You know, which, and which, which church is right? And, you know, what reform should there be if there should be any? So, for instance, two people, um, Desiderius Erasmus and Thomas More, actually spent years writing letters back and forth to each other. Both of them were Catholic, and yet Erasmus absolutely believed that the Catholic Church needed to be reformed, and he believed in translating the Bible. He was a scholar. He could read in both Latin and Greek, and he wanted, he felt that the Bible really should be translated into vernacular languages so people could read it. Sir Thomas More was a far more devout Catholic, if you want to think about it that way, and he absolutely disagreed with him and felt that the church was perfect. And any question of that went, you know, was, was you know, going towards heresy. And Thomas More was actually chancellor of England under Henry VIII, and that will become important later. But he actually spent much of his career trying to stamp out heresy against the Catholic church. So he, and he put, we know, he probably put well over 500 people to death for being heretics, for, committing heresy against the, the, the church. So, because he was a very devout Catholic, that will come and haunt him in a little bit, but we'll get there. Okay, so there's another reformer. Then we get to Henry V, I mean, Henry VIII. Henry VIII, probably you know of him best, you're thinking, oh man, he's the one who had all those wives, right? He did. And part of it is because he really desperately wanted to have a son who would inherit his throne and that son had to be, to be an inheritor, who had to be the next king, that son had to be married within wedlock. And so this was the problem. He had um, his, his, actually, he was not intended to be king. Henry was not. His older brother, Arthur, was. And he married Catherine of Aragon. And he, unfortunately, as soon as he, as, it was not very long after they had married, maybe a year or so, and he died. He was, he was always a little sickly, um, but he, he died. So that left Catherine of Aragon, and she was childless. She had no children by him. And then she was kind of on her own. So was she going to go back to Aragon, back to Spain, or a region in Spain, or was she going to stay? And Henry VIII, we understand, I mean, we're not sure exactly, but we think he actually liked her. Like they were friends at least, if not, if he didn't have kind of a, you know, an actual crush on her or something like that. But she, even though she was a little older than he was, she, he married her and they had one child, but only one. She actually had several stillbirths. So, um, and this was a, he married, so he married his brother's widow. Now you think, okay, well, that's kind of sweet. No, it actually isn't. By law at that time, he was committing incest because he was marrying his sister. And so a lot of people already kind of did not like the choice he had made. Um, and so in some ways they were just like, well, serves them right if they don't have a lot of children. But she didn't, she, had, she actually had several miscarriages and did not, and I think she had at least one stillborn male, but Mary, their child Mary was the only person to survive and she's female. So um, 
King and King Henry kind of had a wandering eye anyway. Well, by then he was kind of, he'd sort of, they'd broken up sort of, you know, even though they were still married, but there was no such thing as divorce at this point there, in anywhere. There was, you couldn't divorce people. You could in other countries, but not in Christian country. Christianity, um, well, Catholicism did not allow for divorce. You could have a marriage annulled, but the only way you could do that, as we established with Henry II, is to annul your marriage and the annulment could only happen if you didn't have children. That was the assumption was that you could not have children or you could not even consummate the marriage. And so then it could just be annulled so that each person could go their separate ways, marry somebody else and actually have children. Who knows whose fault it is or whatever. Well, Henry VIII wanted an annulment, kind of like Henry II wanted an annulment. Why? So he could marry the person he wanted to marry. Henry II didn't want to be married to Eleanor of Aquitaine but she'd already had multiple children by him. Well, King Henry VIII didn't want to be married to Catherine of Aragon because he wanted a woman who could give him a son. And so he asked for an annulment as well. But remember, they'd had children. Only one had survived, and that was Mary, you know, little, and she was only a little kid at the time. But he wanted to be able to annul the marriage. So he asked. Sorry. He asked the Pope for an annulment. Pope said, no, just like Henry II had asked. And before, remember, Thomas Beckett was was friend to Henry II. And Thomas, you know, but he became Archbishop of Canterbury. And Henry II said, good, go and ask the Pope for an, a marriage annulment for me. And Thomas refused. Henry II had him killed, slaughtered inside the Canterbury Cathedral. And then the church got mad and did something about it. Well, Henry VIII, applies for an annulment, they say no, and Henry VIII is like, well, I'm not putting up with that. And he develops in 1531, he starts the Church of England. And the Church of England is pretty much very similar to the Catholic Church with one big stipulate, well, two big changes. One, the Pope is not, the, is not the head of the church, the King of England is. In fact, even today, we have now Charles, what is it, Charles III? He is on the throne and he is the head of the Church of England even today. So he, he doesn't really ro rule the country anymore because the king doesn't have that power, but he is still the head of the church even today. Well, Henry VIII declared himself the head of this Church of England, the Anglican Church. But not only did he do that, but he required everybody at court and everyone who worked with him and for him they all had to sign a form saying we no longer recognize the Pope as the, the, you know, the head of the church. And we recognize instead the head of the church, the Church of England, is Henry VIII. And we are now Anglican. We're no longer Catholic. So everybody had to sign this statement. Well, he also granted himself a divorce from Catherine and Mary Anne Boleyn. And they were required to recognize that new marriage. So recognize not only that the, the divorce not an annulment, divorce had happened, but that she was now, Anne Boleyn was now Queen Anne and was the rightful queen of England next to, you know, married to Henry VIII. Well, Thomas Beckett, I mean, Thomas More here, different Thomas. So remember, Thomas Beckett was slaughtered. Well, Thomas More was Chancellor of England. He was literally second in command. The only person above him was the King of England. And he had been pretty good friends with Henry VIII for many years. Well, Henry VIII does this. And um, in the, you know, in, in the years before this, remember Thomas More had been persecuting and even um, convicting and executing heretics, people who were trying to be Protestant and going against the Catholic Church. Well, Henry VIII gives him the document to sign and he has to recognize Anne as the 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 appropriate wife and the Queen of England, and he refuses. He will not deny the Pope. He will not recognize Henry VIII as the as the, the head of the church, and he will not recognize the marriage. All three of those things are enough for the king to essentially say, you're committing treason, and he was beheaded. So two Thomases in a row, well, not in a row, but at two different times, were both, both got on the wrong side of a Henry, both because of a marriage and an annulment, and both lost their lives. One was slaughtered in a church. This one was actually put to death for treason. His, his head was cut from his shoulders. 
because he had supposedly committed treason against King Henry VIII because he didn't recognize Anglicanism and, be, and essentially convert. Now, if you go to an Anglican service, they're actually really similar to Catholic. So the only thing they really changed is that the head of their church is different and divorce is okay. And they also made it so priests, you know, people who were ministers could take, you know, they didn't have to take a vow of celibacy. They could marry just like other Protestant ministers could marry. Okay, so there we have all these different ways and reasons. I mean, obviously King, King Henry VIII's, you know, reasons for, you know, switching to Protestantism are probably the most suspect of any of them. But all of them wanted some type of church form and all of them too were bucking against the power that the church, had, that the Holy Roman Catholic Church had held for many, many, many centuries. So part of what helped spread Protestantism, though, we became the printing press. So remember, we talked about the 95 thesis, theses and how they ended up being spread, you know, printed and, and translated into other languages and then and, and shipped off. Essentially, they were spread all through Europe. And what's different about the printing press is, remember, we, we, the church would actually, you know, do things against someone who had translated the Bible. Well, but if they were translating the Bible back in the medieval period, they were doing so by hand. And so what would happen is the person would be taken into ecclesiastical trial. They would, you know, be told you can't do this. And then their, their copy that they had been making, the translation would be destroyed once you have the printing press. So consider the translation that, that Martin Luther made in Germany. Well, he translated the whole book into German that translation was printed. So even if they found Martin Luther and said, you can't translate this anymore and stop it, he had already printed thousands of copies of this book and more copies would be printed. There's no way the church could track down all of the copies. So at this point, once we have the printing press, there is no way to stop the translation of the Bible into the vernacular. The church can't do it. Even if they had all the money in the world, they could not track down all of the copies and stop them all. And so now suddenly there was just no way they could stop the, it was a rush of translation. Every place in, in, in Europe, every, all the people who, especially those of Protestant leaning, even those who weren't, they wanted the translation of the Bible. They wanted to read it for themselves. And it's something they had not been able to do for over a millennium. And in addition to that, people, a lot of the scholars, including Martin Luther and John Calvin and others, wrote scholarship and translations and um, interpretations of the Bible. And those essays were printed. And many of these things were printed in smaller installments. And so people could get them even for a penny or two a piece and buy leaflets. Essentially, it's like, it's kind of like when we had the early gospels before they put together a Bible. The gospels were just on like li little rolls of paper, little scrolls. And so, you could just have one at a time. Well, the same thing is you could buy one essay at a time. And so you didn't have to buy even whole books of essays, although people did. But there was a demand for it. People wanted to be able to read all of this thought and, and reason through all of it with them, for themselves. So in some ways, the people in the North were more fervently religious at this point because they were, they were struggling to essentially define what it was to be whatever faith, whatever sect within Protestantism they were. And they were trying to define it through the text that had been translated into German, into English, etc. So you can see the dates for a couple. Erasmus actually translated into Greek very early on, but it never was printed. And then Martin Luther's German translation was definitely printed and shared tremendously. William Tyndale's English translation was printed, and yet he ended up being executed by the Catholic Church for translating the Bible into English. But then by 1611, of course, this is towards the end of the Renaissance, King James, he's actually, it's kind of an interesting, I don't know, list of people. I probably should do this. I'm gonna go ahead and share a different something. Um, I'm gonna share a web browser instead. And because I wanna do a search, um, just to show you the list, and I, I always have my stuff in dark mode, sorry. 
So let's just look at the list and, and I'm going to just go through, I wish they put them in order. This is not in order, y'all. Okay. Thank you. I, actually, I'll do rulers <laughs> because there's a lot of queens. Okay. And what we will do, we're, not, we're going to skip all the Athelberts and stuff like that because that's way early. Mm -hmm. I just have to get rid of this window. Okay, so I'm just make, making this bigger. That's all I'm doing. Okay, so if we go to where we actually are starting, we have Henry, just all the, okay, so House of York. Okay, Henry the Seventh was the first Tudor, the House of Tudor, after the War of the Roses. But then Henry the Eighth, here's Henry the Eighth, dun dun dun. And then his son, who, who he was only, I mean, he died at, you know, he died, I was 15 when he died. Um, he, his father, you know, Henry VIII actually had several wives. He actually had six total. Two of them he divorced, two he beheaded. And one outlived him. And I think one died in childbirth. But anyway, so he divorced one. You know, we divorced, we went through a lot of them. And he had two girls and a, and a boy. He had, so he had Mary first, that was with his first wife. Second wife, he had um, Elizabeth. And then the, the, I think it was the fourth wife, he had Edward. Edward was the youngest, but he was the boy, so he got to be king first. And so Edward only ruled for a couple of years. He was, he was Protestant. And then he, um, he eventually, just died. He was he was always kind of sickly, and he never he never had children, so he was done. After that, the oldest sister Mary was um, put into place, so she was you know she was just next in line. She was also extremely Catholic, and so she she was nicknamed Bloody Mary because she. Oh, this is just driving me crazy. This advertising stuff. So I'm gonna make it bigger. Okay, so so much better. So she was nicknamed Bloody Mary because she started essentially requiring people to change back to Catholicism or be beheaded. Um, and she did. She beheaded a lot of people. She be, and she, including some of her own relatives, because they refused to go back to Catholicism. But she tried to reinstitute Catholicism in the country. And it didn't work super well. A lot of people, you know, they were very un uncomfortable with it. And um, then she died in childbirth. She was actually married to Philip of Spain, Philip II, I think. And um, she died in childbirth. So she never had any children. Because of that, her younger sister Elizabeth um, took the throne. She was Protestant. But she kind of went through this whole thing where, you know, it's kind of a don't ask, don't tell. Like, you know, if you're Catholic, okay. If you're not, okay, I don't care just the the government is protestant okay and they weren't necessarily anglican in fact she had two chancellors of england at the time remember thomas more was chancellor of england under under henry the eighth well she had two the first one lord burley was was not only protestant he was puritan and the second one um the, edward veer the 17th earl of oxford was catholic so she didn't even have a single anglican um person as chancellor. So they didn't even share her, but she didn't care. She just don't, it was, she didn't persecute anybody for religious reasons, none of that. Well, then after she died, she was technically, well, she was, she had no children that we know of. She was called the Virgin Queen, although it is likely that she had syphilis because all of her hair fall out, fell out and towards the end of her life, she probably died of syphilis or the things that went with it. So she probably was not actually a virgin. But I'm not going to slander her anymore. She was, she ruled for forever. Anyway, then she died though. Her nephew, who was actually son of Mary Queen of Scots, whom she had put to death because Mary Queen of Scots, with the help of many others, tried to take her throne. Um, he became king. So Mary Queen of Scots' son from Scotland, James the first of of he was James the first of England, but James the sixth of Scotland. He became king. He is Catholic, but he kind of just kept it on the down low. And he's actually the one who sponsored the King James Version of the Bible translation. So he was Catholic, but he wasn't that Catholic. His son Charles, though, 
was. Charles I was so Catholic, and we're going to talk about him later on, that he essentially said, well, we need to make this place Catholic again. The, the parliament was predominantly Puritan, which is one of the Protestant sects, and they weren't going to put up with it. And so they actually deposed him and executed him and started the Puritan Commonwealth for roughly 11 years, depending on which, where you mark it beginning and ending, under Oliver and Thomas Cromwell. And then um, eventually they, their parliament dissolves mostly because of its lack of popularity. And the government asks Charles's first son, Charles, to return to England and become king. And so essentially we have, you know, that little point where all of the Cromwells and, and, and Richard Cromwell are, are, are in charge. And then Charles II sec comes in during the restoration. And we'll talk about that when we get to chapter four. But then he is sort of Catholic. Mostly he just really likes partying. And then James II, his son, is very Catholic. And he says, you know, we really need to make this place Catholic again. He gets booted. And from that point until now, they essentially make a law that only Protestants can be the king and queen of or king or queen of England. You have to be Protestant because they don't want it to turn back to Catholicism. So there's a really short history lesson. And now I'm going to go back to sharing the thing again. Hopefully that helped, but it it it's it shows kind of how volatile all of this was and how very quickly um people made enemies of each other. It kind of shows too why people were so uh, even today, you know, we we think I don't know how much you guys know, it depends on how old y'all are y'all are, but like in Northern Ireland, all the dissension and the the unrest between Catholics and Protestants that really became quite violent back in the 70s and 80s. Well, 1970s and 80s. But that actually stems from a very long standing division between Protestantism and, and Catholicism. One thing too is when, when England took over Scotland by force and then took over parts of Ireland by force and Wales and Cornwall and things like that to make the UK, the vast majority of those other people were Catholic. And, and, and so part of the taking over was in, enforcing Protestantism. And so there's there's already that kind of division. People don't want to be told what they're supposed to believe either way, you know. And so, and that's human. I think it makes total, a lot of sense. Okay. So now let's talk about other writing. So obviously everything wasn't religious. In fact, the vast majority of much of the popular courtly writing was highly not religious. It had it made almost no mention of Protestantism of any kind or Catholicism. There were people who, you know, at this time who were very Protestant or very Catholic, and yet the vast majority of popular literature that came out from this area era was not religious at all. So people who were very devoutly Protestant, and they were, you know, especially like the Puritans and, and Calvinists and some of the other, you know, very, very religious groups, really focused much more on their religious essays on, on biblical teaching and biblical reading. So for many of them, the only book that you should even be reading was the Bible. So all this other stuff was, had to go. But in popular world, the secular world, the non-religious world, people wanted entertainment rather like the Romans and stuff. Remember too, they had accessed the classical literature from ancient Greece and Rome. What did that include? Printed plays. It also included poetry. It included discussions of literature. It also included, by way of Italy, a lot of the Italian writings that had happened, including poems by Petrarch and other poets, you know, not just sonnet forms, but other love poems. The whole idea of that love ballad, you know, the, love, the, the expression of a devotion to a woman who's unattainable. But it also included the epic literature, for instance, like Orlando Furioso, and and it included translations into Italian of a lot of the Greek and Roman plays. And so these plays became the inspiration for much of the popular theater, which really took hold in England. It also, it would to a degree arise in France, certainly in Italy, it was very common at this point, they had traveling troops of players. Many of them, they probably, um, patterned themselves much more over Roman theater. So the, the stereotyped characters, the um, 
and the the kind of silly situations that are more typical in like situation comedy you know sitcoms today have this you know you misunderstand what somebody said and the people get jealous for no reason and all this other stuff goofy happens and there's all these jokes so that was more italian theater for the in the theater of england though a lot of courtiers you know people who were very high ranking even elizabeth queen elizabeth herself wrote poetry she wrote sonnets actually but there were a lot of groups of sonnets, and many of those sonnets were following that Petrarchan tradition, where they were, you know, addressed to a particular person, um, often female. And I told you in one of the earlier things that that one person, one poet in particular, had actually wooed his woman, and that is Sir Philip Sidney. So the third on this list, he wrote a series of sonnets that asked Astro Phil and Stella, and those. He, the person who was addressed in those sonnets ended up marrying him and they lived happily ever after and had a bunch of kids. And William Shakespeare, we know, wrote a whole group of sonnets, um, some of them to this woman who had like dark, obviously black hair, and then other ones to somebody who was either much younger than him. We, we just can't tell. The, the weird thing is, is that even those poems, there's one that's probably most famous where he compares himself to a dying fire the end, you know, twilight at the end of the day. So he's obviously aging. And yet the, they were published when William Shakespeare of Stratford was only 25 years old. So I don't quite know what to do with all of those. And then we have Edmund Spencer, who wrote not only, uh, he invented his own kind of sonnet, Shakespeare did too. And Sidney wrote, he actually followed Shakespeare's tradition and, followed, and wrote the Shakespearean sonnets. Spencer wrote a much more elaborate sonnet. And he also wrote, he's the one who wrote uh, the Fairy Queen, and it's about a bunch of knights' adventures based much more in Protestantism. There's a lot more moral reasoning in it, and yet it's absolutely patterned after Orlando Furioso from the Italian sources, from, um, Ario, from yeah, Orlando Furioso by Lodovico Ariosto. And so th those were absolutely part of court as well. They also put on plays in court, but very soon plays that were done at court were spread around to the general public. And that's through the theater system a little bit below the Thames River. So in the bad, the red light district of town, several theaters were put up by middle-class people, you know, enterprising men who all kind of collected their funds, built the theater and then shared the profits as co-owners of these public theaters. And the theaters, the, the, the plays that were, you know, obviously Shakespeare wrote a ton of plays and his are the most famous, but there were a, a large number of playwrights who wrote both tragedies and comedies, or you know, in, in Shakespeare's case, even some histories. And a lot of those, their structure was patterned after the Greek and Roman models. They were a little less strict, certainly with the like the unities of time, place, and action. Okay, that wasn't so common. They didn't care. You know, Shakespeare went would span, you know, he'd take seven years apart and he and would make it the very next scene. So he he they broke the rules. But those, that, that was the first time we really had not only a popular theater, but a professional theater. So until that point, um, we did not have, I mean, these were actors who were trained to act. Often they were raised, like they, they came as teenagers, when, especially the men, because the voice, their voices hadn't changed. So they played the women and then they were training as actors while they were doing this. And so eventually as their voices changed, then they'd have to take other parts. But many of these people would be actors their entire lives. And people would pay to see these. They, they, this, this, if you really want to see the, the Elizabethan theater, they actually did build a replica globe. And it is quite accurate. It's actually a fun place to see a play. I'm going to be in London in a few weeks. And I'm going to see um, the Midsummer Night's Dream, which I've never seen. I've seen filmed versions of them, and I've seen one production at a college, but that's it's the last time I've seen. That was years and years ago, like 30 something years ago that I saw that. So um, even today, you can they have they have a standing room where they call the Penny Public, and they stand right in front of the stage and around the stage. They stand for the entire performance. The seats, they don't quite fit, like the replica globe does not quite fit 20 to 30,000 people because I think we've gotten a bit bigger than we used to be. But the seats are also a lot more spacious. We're not sitting on little like cartons or stairs. It's much more comfortable. And, but they still sell fresh fruit. They, this, all of the, the productions are, that happened back in the Elizabethan times happened during the day. 
Today, they actually have artificial lighting, so you can watch evening performances. But both of the ones, the one I watched of Hamlet last time I was in London, and the one I will watch this time will both be matinees. They'll both be during the, the afternoon. So we will, we will watch them at the typical time, actually right around noon. Um, but they had tragedies and comedies, you know, they kind of mixed around. They also had satire and they did have ba histories, some of them based on very far history, like Romeo, well, like um, uh, Greek, some of them were based like Troilus and Cressida, Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida is based on the Trojan War. It actually has Achilles in it. But then Antony and Cleopatra and Julius Caesar, both also by Shakespeare, were based on Roman history. And yet he also wrote histories about more recent kings, not Henry VIII, but kings before then. So um, though there was a, a, a play made of Henry VIII as well. So he, he definitely had a lot of plays about the Ro War of the Roses, the war between the Lancasters and the York families in England over who was gonna rule. Because it was, it was pretty bloody time, lots of excitement. So maybe that's why they did it. But um, you don't have to remember all these plays or anything. You don't have to remember any of these plays. Um, if you have read any of them, though, I would love to know. So put that in your journal. If there's any that you read in school or didn't read. When I was in school, I was able as a senior to take a, I don't know, an independent study course. And I did it in Shakespeare. And so I read 27 of his 37 plays, I think before I graduated from high school, but I was a weirdo. I told you I was a nerd. So um, no, there's no expectation that you do this, but if you have any interest, especially if there was a play that you read and you liked it, um, I do have ones I would definitely recommend. Probably a lot of you have read Macbeth. Um, you might've read Romeo and Juliet as well. In our school, when I was going to school, I, I read, we, we read four total, one each year, even though the third year was American Lit. We read Romeo and Juliet, then Julius Caesar, then Hamlet, and then Macbeth. So, but if you have any interest, just let me know. And these still survive today. They were actually printed at that time. Well, shortly, right around the time of his death. And then people would read the plays as well. Now painting, remember I talked about the fact that painting was going to be much less religious. You're going to think, well, she's lying because what you're going to see over the next couple of frames is very religious painting. This looks, this could look so Catholic. And that's because it was. These are altar pieces, very realistic. And I don't know if you can see, let me, let me make it a little bit bigger because it's just too cool. But I'm going to move it over so you can see the actual artwork. Um, but the, the draping of the figures is much more realistic. Each of them, you can see in the background, the shading, and it looks like there's an arch back behind them. So they, they look like they're enclosed in an actual room. And the, the two statues, uh, the shading is, is so, I mean, even in the hair, they're, they're made, even though they're paintings, they're made to look as if they are marble statues. And so this is much more of the Renaissance style in that they're really trying to make it look as realistic and as three-dimensional as possible, if that makes sense. And I'm gonna make this smaller again. So that's very typical of, of Northern Renaissance painting early on, okay? But the reason we have these, these surviving, that's a, uh, I think it's a quatrichte. It's four pieces, panels all stuck together. The reason these survive is because they were hidden. Had they not been hidden, they would not, we would not have them today to see. And yet they're in really good, thank goodness they restored well because they, they still look great. Most painting was portrait painting and landscapes. It was pretty much secular. They, we also started really getting a lot of still lifes and we'll talk about those as well. But painting, even though it was, of course this painting doesn't look as realistic as the ones we just looked at. And yet, um, it's, it's, it's certainly not idealized. Let me put it that way. They're not, they're not making the man look super brawny <laughs> or the woman look super attractive. And if you have questions about these paintings, certainly as you go along, uh, you know, hopefully my discussion will help, but feel free to email anything to me about these paintings. If you still have remaining questions. Now, this was actually a wedding portrait and it's, you might think, well, why is she wearing green? Well, until Queen Victoria, women didn't wear white in a wedding. Um, they wore their best dress 
they might have a dress made, but it was a dress that they could wear again because it was, I mean, it, most women didn't only own a few dresses. Even the wealthier women would only own so many. Um, books like to make it out like they had a new dress every single day, but that's not true. They were too intensive. They were all hand sewn and even weaving the fabric was, was very time intensive and took a lot of skill and a lot of, um, it's just, it's, it, it's extremely expensive to make a single dress. And so it was kind of like the way you used to hand do the, the, the printed books Well, you, before they were printing. Well, now, at this time, there was no machine sewing. There was no, I mean, you just, you three or four people would work on a dress over the course of a week to get it done. I mean, it was just, it took forever. And so they just wore their nicest outfit. The other thing people often ask is, is she pregnant? No, well, probably not, I should say. But the thing is, is when a woman got married, the primary reason for marriage was to have children. And so the, the garments women would wear would emphasize this aspect of their clothing, that they would make them look like they already had poochy tummies because the assumption was if a woman was too thin, she wouldn't be able to have children. So it's opposite the way that we think today, that women are all supposed to be super scrawny. Well, they weren't, they were supposed to be squishy. And in fact, the squishier they were, the more likely they were gonna be, have a healthy baby. At least that's what the assumption was. And so women would essentially wear clothing that made them look like they had a really big rear end and a really nice squishy tummy so that they looked like they could easily bear children because when, women so often died in childbirth. So what her, the fact that her dress is green which is, you know, nature and regeneration and healthiness. And the fact that her tummy is exceptionally poochy, that suggests that she's gonna be able to have lots of healthy children. They're also holding hands, the husband and me. Now, this is no doubt because of the expense of what they're wearing, this is absolutely gonna be an arranged marriage. The Arnolfini and his wife may have met each other several times, but they're not in love with each other. But you notice that he's kind of looking not so much at us, but he's looking ahead and yet he's holding her hand and she's looking at him. So there's an assumption that she is going to be submissive to him, but because they're holding hands, they're going to be friends. And the little doggy down at the bottom also symbolizes this. This little dog is, is cute and fuzzy and he's, he's going to be friendly, just like their marriage is going to be friendly. And the fact that Arnolfini actually has his his little clod, but so you see those things that look like, I don't know, torture devices over on the far left and the bottom, those are his shoes, but he's taken them off and they're in the bedroom of all places. Can you imagine having a wedding portrait taken in your bedroom? Well, that's what they did. Why? Because the marriage bed is going to be productive. He's going to be comfortable. That's what those shoes taken off. Mean. They're going to be, they're going to have a comfortable arrangement, a comfortable marriage, it's going to be fruitful, judging by the red bed and the fruit, yes, actual fruit, on the windowsill and on the little cabinet below the windowsill, there's, there's a bunch of little fruit. So it's going to be a fruitful alliance. They're gonna have lots of children and they're gonna be happy and friendly. So all of these different elements within it are symbols. And in fact, if you, really, if you can find a, a way that really scooches up to that mirror in the background, the 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 painter the, the person who painted this his his um signature van eyck's signature is above the the mirror scrolled on the wall although it wasn't there originally of course and if you really close go close up on the mirror if you have a good enough photo of this you can um see him in the background between the two figures backs so that it was, it was actually very realistic and it was definitely three-dimensional. They're, they're using the single point perspective, although many portraits you know, in the North did not use the single point perspective very accurately. But he's trying to, he's trying to look, make it look like a very realistic, naturalistic portrait. And yet also all of those little items are still suggesting or symbolizing what's gonna come out of the marriage. So they're both symbolic and realistic, if that makes sense in the North. Um, other portrait painters, this Nicholas Hilliard was probably the most, most famous at the Elizabethan court. Elizabeth is painted in the, in the center. She's the central picture that I have here. But other portraits, many of the portraits are kind of like, I don't know if you guys remember when you were seniors and you gra were graduating and you were passing out your, here's, here's 
a wallet size, you know, or the little bitty baby size, you'd pass them out to friends or to girls you really wanted to ask out or something. Well, that he made miniature portraits as well. In fact, the portrait over to the right, um, no, to the left, you know, of him actually, um, he, it's, it's so cute. He's got a little beard and all that stuff. Well, that's a tiny portrait. It's actually only, it's not even three inches tall. And, but Nicholas Hilliard was a goldsmith. And so he was used to, to working with tiny little details. And so both the portrait of the young man's just his, his you know, the, the big, and yes, they, the men did actually have these humongous ruffs. Um, and they weren't, they were starched, but they actually weren't sewn together, they were pinned. And so the only way to get out of them is to unpin them. So literally people were walking around with stick pins in their garments all day long. They were very uncomfortable. Why people wore them all the time, I don't know. Um, they were very lacy too, and men wore a lot of lace at this time. You'll notice the young man leaning against the tree and the other one, all of those little, I mean, again, this is a, it's not, a, it's a little over five inches, I think, tall, the original. And yet the detail, if you really look close up on his clothing and of the flowers and the leaves is amazing for something so tiny. None of these are really as big as they look. They're smaller, except for the Elizabeth portraits is bigger than this. But they, people would actually exchange miniatures. So you could, for a very small amount of money, you could buy a miniature of yourself and give it to the person that you were in love with. So you could exchange love tokens or whatever. And, and still, it, it, they were beautiful portraits, as you can see, and yet they were on such a small scale that you could do it cheaply. And so honestly, middle-class people could have these kinds of miniatures made and they could exchange them or they could, they didn't put them up on the walls, but they could absolutely have them. And so there, we have much more portraiture of people and how they dressed and how they looked at this time than we have had for any of the previous generations because so many ordinary people, private individuals had their portraits made. Other people, and this is, this is, the, Peter Borgo was not, um, he didn't do portraits so much as he did scenes and he definitely was good at the landscape. You can see that here. And if you look up Bruegel and look up Bruegel paintings, you're going to see a mass of them. And there, m many of them are of rural subjects. So he loved working class people. Um, in the, the painting on the left, for instance, he's de depicted people who were essentially resting kind of at lunchtime from um, harvesting wheat. And so they have a bunch of, you can see the wheat bundles all stacked up in towers over on the left, on the very far right of that painting. And then you can see the sheaves of wheat that are just clustered together that haven't been put together into the, the larger bundles. And then you can see some, some people are still kind of working and a bunch of other people are under the tree resting and having lunch. So, but he, he definitely, he loved the landscape and he, he didn't use like single point perspective or anything like that, but he absolutely understood that the items in the foreground, we're going to be larger because they're closer to the, you know, the viewer than things way off in the distance. And he very often used a diagonal line. So he would start from one bottom corner of the painting and move across the painting and go further and further out in the distance. So in, in the case of these, these people relaxing, we start in the bottom right corner, go past the tree and the people underneath it, and then go out towards the little you know, the, the, the valleys behind it. So these harvesters are in the front and then farther off into the distance, as far as you can see until it kind of fades out into the mist is the rest of the countryside. In this bottom painting though, and I'm gonna blow it up a bit so you can see it better. It's, it's an interesting one because it actually deals with Greek mythology. And you'll remember the story of, the story I gave of, and I, I'm going to try not to go too far, of Icarus and Daedalus. Yeah, I'd want to. Okay, so in the Greek myth, remember we had the labyrinth with the Minotaur, and the Minotaur was eight people, and so they had to. They created this. Actually, an inventor named Daedalus created this. Um, labyrinth this maze under the ground where they put the minotaur so he wouldn't hurt anybody and then athens had to bring seven youths and seven maidens every year to feed the minotaur so he wouldn't starve to death well then of course theseus came and he goes i'm going to go and i'm going to get the minotaur and he goes into the labyrinth and everything well 
the person who invented the, the labyrinth though was Daedalus. And Daedalus was um, super smart and definitely a scientist and inventor. Well, but once he built it, the king didn't want the secret to get out of how to go through the labyrinth. So he imprisoned Daedalus and his son Icarus. Well, Daedalus built himself, and I told this story before, so hopefully you remember, he built himself wings and he built wings for his son out of feathers and wax and other stuff. And then he, they were going to fly out, essentially, they were going to leave their prison window and fly out into, and then fly off into the distance and get away from the island of, of Minos. And so he told his son, though, he says, look, this is made of, you know, wax and feathers. If you get too close to the sun, the feathers, the, the wax is going to melt and you're going to fall into the ocean. Okay. So that's, and then, of course, in the original story, Daedalus and Icarus go off flying. Icarus gets super enthusiastic, flies too close to the sun, his wax melts, and he falls into the ocean. Okay. Now, this painting, which is actually, it doesn't include the entire painting. The painting goes up higher, so there's more of the sky showing, and that will be significant in a second. But essentially, this, this painting is called The Fall of Icarus. Now, what is the painting of? Well, in the foreground, you can see somebody is a farmer and he's actually creating lines to plant his crops, okay? So he's actually sowing rows of, you know, and, and creating the creases where he'll put the, the seeds in and, and plant his crops and grow crops. Then behind, past him, you know, a little bit farther away from the foreground is a man with, who's a shepherd and he is, He's a t got a ton of sheep around him and he's just kind of looking up into the sky. Then behind that is a big ship and there's a sea and there's another several other boats and then there's a city off in the distance. So we still have that long perspective, that landscape that's typical of Bruegel. But where's Icarus? This is, you know, I've, I've had, I, obviously I'm not in the live class so I can't have you pick, but down in the very, it's close to the, it's it, look in the water but down on the right-hand side, down in the dark water, and I'm, I'm using my cursor, but I don't know if you can see it, um, is two, a set of two little legs sticking out of the water as he splashes into it. And what's important about this, and this is, I think, the point of Broglie, he's kind of being mean, poor little Icarus, to, to the poor little kid, but he's essentially saying, here's this epic you know, Greek story, and yet in, in the daily lives of regular people, it doesn't matter. So here's the farmer farming. Here's the shepherd being a shepherd. Here's a guy down at the bottom over by the water right near where Icarus's legs are and he's fishing. The ship is not far away from Icarus's legs and the ship is doing nothing. It's pointed away and going in a different direction. In other words, Icarus died. And it actually the reason I mentioned that painting part that it was missing is up in the sky above where it, this gets cut off is a flying man. That's Daedalus. So his dad is looking down at the water, and it's actually his sight line that helps you find Icarus's legs. So he is devastated by his de the death of his son. Everybody else doesn't care. And that's the point. It's kind of mean. It is. But it's funny. And it is. But it's essentially, he's saying, look, what's epic to one person doesn't really mean a whole lot to everybody else. And so we need to take, you know, take it all with a grain of salt. He's essentially being unserious on purpose. And he's making fun of this kind of mythic tendency to be overdramatic. He also painted a painting called The Blind Leading the Blind. And it was absolutely people who were wearing blindfolds trying to lead each other. And it's, it's meant to be humorous. So he, he definitely had viewpoints about humanity. But he certainly felt that, you know, where was the realism? You know, what was most important? Real people in real situations. And some of his paintings would end up really um, having an effect on a new movement in painting that we'll see in chapter 10 called genre painting, where people really try to emphasize paintings about middle and lower classes and showing what they really, what lives they really lived and trying to be as realistic as possible. And that's kind of what Br Peter Bruegel did. Now we have another guy who's whacked. I, and if you look up Hieronymus Bosch, and his name is Hieronymus, that honestly, J.K. Rowling, when she did um, Harry Potter, needed to make somebody Hieronymus something because that's just such an interesting name. But he paints like his interesting name. And this is probably his most famous painting. And it's the Garden of Earthly De Delights. At least that's the middle of it. 
it's a triptych and actually a lot of religious paintings were triptychs at this time where each side so the two the narrower paintings are can be folded they're actually hinged and so they can be folded closed in front of the middle painting so that it closes up and there's you don't see anything it looks like a cupboard when it's shut but this was Hieronymus Bosch mostly painted for secular people, people who, you know, private citizens who just wanted to, to paint some type of a painting. This is his most famous, but it's not his weirdest. If you like Salvador Dali in, you know, more of the modern period with the melting clocks and stuff like that, I think Salvador Dali had to have studied Hieronymus Bosch because so many of the figures are, are similar. There are similarities in style and texture and everything, the, the weird dreamlike strangeness you know, but he also what Hieronymus Bosch really excelled in is a, is the number of naked bodies he could put inside a single painting. So I'm not going to, you know, bring all this up really big, but you can certainly do that in Google if you want to. Essentially, though, this was purported to be a moral painting. This is why the very first slide of the triptych, that first left column, is Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. All the animals are kind of roaming around happy and God is in the center between the two of them kind of blessing their union. Okay, but they're happy. Everything is pretty and pristine and serene. It's just a lovely place with a pretty fountain, you know, even if it's a weird looking fountain, it's and there's even a unicorn drinking from the The river in the in what kind of, kind of the middle part of the painting. So that's Adam and Eve before the fall. And this is where we get to the, the, to the religious side of it. After they fell, sinfulness became everything. And so what you see in the middle triptych is all sorts of people doing all sorts of naughty things. People are killing each other, slaughtering each other, going to war, but they're also having orgies and tons of nude bodies everywhere, doing all sorts of naughty things they shouldn't be doing. It's a very salacious, um, it's much more, you know, on the lines of, I don't know, Playboy or something, you know, lots of nude women and men doing all sorts of naughty things that no one should depict on a painting. Okay. So people would be horrified by that, of course. You know, oh no. Of course, the, while they're doing that, they're looking at every single one of the things going, oh my gosh, I can't believe he painted that, you know, because we're, we're ju we just love that kind of stuff, even if we say that it's sinful. Well, then the last part, and this is where we get to the moral part, even more moral, is that this is hell. So that that the the part of the painting that is on the very far right is this is the punishment that we have to endure for the rest of our lives, well, for eternity, because of the sinfulness that we engaged in, all the naughty things that were happening in the middle painting. And so now people are being stabbed, they're being cut in half, everything is twisted and weird. It's it's almost like a horror film. It's, it's a lot like actually one of those, you know, some of the weirder horror video games, you know, where the, things are doing things that they shouldn't do, you know, body parts, like they have the ear with the knife sticking out of it, you know, all these weird, it's just weird and creepy. And that's, of course, our punishment for being naughty earlier. And so that's where the moralism supposedly comes from. Most people don't buy it. I'm sure they didn't buy it back then. They wouldn't say, oh, it is a moral painting. No, it's not a moral painting. If anything, it's the reason you could shut it is so that people who shouldn't be looking at all those those nudie bodies don't get to. So the the owner, the person who purchased the painting, can open it and you know ogle all he wants without anybody else looking at him funny or something. You know, it kind of keeps it private. Anyway, so the only art at this time, and this is really crucial, the only art at this time that was religious is in print okay so remember i talked about those those the religious paintings we kind of went and the 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 chapter spends more time on it than i do but those religious paintings for the most part have survived because they were hidden once protestant took protestantism took over the majority of the north of north of europe then those were no longer okay and they would have been destroyed by iconoclasts but in print like, for instance, with the printing of the Bible, it was extremely common and it became quite popular to put religious prints inside of the book. So this print, for instance, um, was a print of 
the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So at the end of the New Testament, this would have been placed so that it could illustrate all of the different things that are part of the very last book in the New Testament. You know, this idea of what's going to happen in the future, the visions of what the um, apocalypse is going to look like. And so many of these kinds of prints are actually very popular. What's cool too is that people would, they like them in the, the, you know, as illustrations inside the book, but they also would purchase them separately. So people would buy prints just of this and then they'd frame them and put them in their house. But it wasn't the same thing as having religious artwork inside the church. And these were also very inexpensive. So for a penny, you could buy one of these and frame it. It's not nearly what it would cost, of course, to get a painting painted. So printing made everything cheaper, and that includes the, you know, the actual artistry. Music was also printed by this time. And so people would, they, a lot more people in the Renaissance learned to play instruments on their own because they had sheet music that they could play from. So it didn't have to be learned through memory. It can actually be learned, um, it could be on paper and you could read music. People would learn to read music. The last thing, and there's not a whole lot to do, um, I do want to talk, let me talk, since I was talking about music before, Renaissance music, courtly music was, had the same um, variability and the same um, complexity that was typical in the Italian Renaissance. Where it differed was, and we mentioned this with Martin Luther, he said he wanted the congregation in a church to be much more participatory. And so in Protestant churches, hymn singing was actually pretty common. Now, many of the the, hymn, the the songs were very simple. Some were accompanied by organs. So there was, and, and eventually, really in the next era or so, the, the pipe organ is going to take over a lot of Northern churches. And so many people will learn to, to sing with music. At this time, you know, at the very beginning, of course, you didn't, you sang a cappella, but that was radically changed, mainly because we needed to keep people on key. So rather than having a, a, a song reader, instead, as they do today, a piano or an organ would play the first, you know, essentially play through the entire song. So you know how the tune goes, and then you would sing the song. Today, we even have churches that don't even, where you don't have to read music, they just put all the lyrics up on the wall that project them. So anybody can sing along as long as they know the tune. And Martin Luther specifically wanted them to have simple tunes that were very easy to memorize so that nobody was struggling to figure out what they were supposed to sing so that people would sing. Because his whole goal was to get as many part people participating during the service as possible. Catholic Church will eventually in the next, in chapter 10, they'll say, nope, we're not doing that. And that's heresy. And you can only use, you know, keep, keep it se separate, either instrumental music or a cappella singing. And it needs to be simple. Don't make it super complex because that's heretical. That's that's heresy. And so and they'll go against all the changes that Martin Luther makes in music. But for a long, for a lot of people, um, singing became the reason to go to church. You know that was actually a draw. In some Protestant sects, though, and even today, that is it is common. For there are several Protestant sects. In you know during the church service when there are is no musical accompaniment, so they literally have someone go up or they have some sort of taped music that they play, so that people can know what or they have a person singing that they tape, and that person sings and guides everybody in the congregation to the tune, but they have no musical accompaniment. There are many Protestant sects that developed at this time during the Protestant Reformation, very early on, that essentially said you can't have an organ in, in or any instrumentation in the um, in the church. Some didn't allow for singing in the church, but certainly with singing, you could not have accompaniment. And so they tore, they went back to the very beginning, you know, where Judaism, for instance, early Christianity and Islam all kept instrumental and vocal music separate. And they said, you can't have, they tore organs out of the, the cathedrals, they actually tore, you know, it, insisted that no music was, no, no instrumental music was allowed at all. And so definitely that was, you know, a tendency and, and there was a, there's still an argument 
for some of that. There are churches today where you could sing a popular tune if it has some sort of religious significance or could have. There are other places where you it has to be an accepted song by that church or you can't sing it within the church confines during a service. Other things, in, and you can see some of these um, elements. The main thing with Nor Northern Renaissance architecture, they were not as centered on the circle and square as the Italian Renaissance had been. And yet they they did try to use some of the similar elements in the way that that the Greeks and Romans had used them. So one thing that they did is they drew back to Gothic time. So for instance, the Chateau de Chambord, which still is in great condition today. Um, I think you can even stay in it if you want to, but it's of course in, in France, but that castle is is not, it doesn't need to be, and yet it is built to be a castle. It looks reminiscent of the medieval castles with one big twist, and that if you look at their windows, they're huge. Even there are even huge windows in the walls of the you know the purported castle walls. So it's not really a defensible castle, but it's meant to be reminiscent of the castle, the medieval castle. And so that was that was pretty typical, and that that was actually used in Spain as well. And then this this is the the part of the Louvre. The Louvre is a massive gallery. So it, this is just one of the structures, but you can see on the structure and I'll go a little bit closer to just real quick. And you can see that it's um, styling on the outside. It uses an alternating arch on the second, look on the second floor. It uses an alternating triangle that is Greek. And you know, that, that top part that would make the roofs that frontispiece for the roof. And so it used the triangle on, over one window and then the next one would be arched and the next one would be a triangle. And so and it also had pillars, also Corinthian, of Corinthian style, but little square pillars in between the windows. Now these are not actual structural pillars and they're not separate from the wall. So in the same way that a lot of buildings were, were built in, in um, Florence this way, so that they had Greek and Roman style, and yet they really weren't using Greek and Roman structure. This is what was happening in other parts of Europe as well, where they're using elements that are reminiscent of Greek and Roman architecture, but they really weren't patterning themselves completely after Greek and Roman architecture. No one would look at this building of the Louvre and go, oh, well, that's Greek and Roman, because it isn't. They mainly just used it for stylistic elements and they were putting a bunch of other stuff in it too, including sculptures. You can see the relief sculptures up on the top floor right into the roof. Those elements are going to actually take over in the, the coming era in chapter 10 when we get to the Baroque movement. It's going to get much more florid with lots of carved pieces and a lot more statuary and everything else when we get to that period. So. If you do have questions, I th that's all that we, we have for this particular chapter. But if you do have questions at any time, you know, once you've viewed this or as you're trying to complete different elements or study for the test, let me know. Um, remember, we'll be, we'll be doing chapter seven, eight, and nine. So we have one more chapter in this unit before we finish up. And then we will end up, that's, that's, that will be the end of unit three. So let me know if you do have questions, though. Please send them to me. Thanks a lot, you guys.